understand the role of the Holy Spirit in your life? I'm Woodrow Kroll, and thank you for joining me today on Back to the Bible. We're going to continue our study in the Gospel of John today. Specifically, we're looking at the end of Jesus' ministry. We're starting our study today in John chapter 16. Tammy Weitzert, my co-host, is here with me as well, and we have some folks who have gathered from, well, all over today to be a part of our study group. Thank you for joining me. And thank you at home for joining me as well. Nice to have you as a part of our study group today. Tammy, we're getting close to the end. We are. The Gospel of John. We are. The Holy Spirit today we're talking Mm -hmm. about. You know, Dr. Kroll, it's interesting that people seem to be confused by the Holy Spirit. We understand Jesus. We understand the Father. So why are we so confused by the Holy Spirit? The role of the Holy Spirit is an issue that has divided the church a lot as opposed to bringing the church together. And that's a shame. There are some people in the 20th century who are of church traditions in which the Holy Spirit became everything in the church tradition, actually worshiped the Holy Spirit. And as we'll find out today, that's not the intent of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, there are some church traditions that are kind of like, well, you remember in Acts chapter 19, there were those who ask, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit of God or not. So there's some church traditions that act like the Spirit doesn't exist, and there are others that act like the Spirit is everything. And I think we have to find a balance between those two things. Well, let's jump right into John chapter 16 today and find out what's going on in the life of the Lord Jesus in John 16. Now, you know that the role of the Holy Spirit is very significant. Jesus has significant relationship to the Holy Spirit, especially at the end of his life. We've now come to the point in Jesus' life where he's saying to his disciples, I'm about to leave you. My time on earth is almost gone. And that's good news and that's bad news. It's bad news because I'm going to leave you, but it's good news because I won't leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send someone equal to me who can minister to you. Now, What he's doing here is this. He's saying, my departure is imminent, but there are two very good pieces of news. One is, even though my departure is imminent, I'm coming back. I will come back and receive you to myself, so where I am, you may be there also. That was John chapter 14 we looked at a few studies ago. He says, the second piece of good news is that when I'm gone, I won't leave you by yourself. In fact, I'll send a helper who will help you understand everything you've seen, everything you've heard from me. And in the context of that comes the words of Jesus in John 16. Let's jump right into the first verse. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Now, what is he saying to his disciples there? He's saying, the time is coming, then if you will live for me, it will not be easy for you to live in this world. I think Jesus has always made the point that if we're living rightly before God, we're going to upset some people in this world. It's so evident to me today that if you want to live righteously before God, you can't please everybody in the world today because the world is not made up of righteous people. So he says, number one, in verses one and two, the times are coming when it's going to get hard for you. If you stand true, hard times will come. Verse three, he says, hard times are going to come because you're living among people who don't even know God. If they knew God, they wouldn't give you a tough time, but they don't. Therefore, you should expect a hard time. Verses four and five, he says to his disciples, you don't have a clue of how difficult it's going to be without me, because you've never experienced life without me. Oh, sure, they experienced life before they met Jesus, but they never experienced saving life, eternal life before they met Jesus. So at this point, he says, you don't know what's coming. I'm preparing you for what you can't even see in the future. And then he says, verse 6, you're going to be sorrowful because I leave you. But the great news in verse 7 is the Holy Spirit will come. When I go, he comes, and he's going to work among you. So what is the Holy Spirit doing today? What is the role of the Holy Spirit today? If you think back to all the things you know about the Bible and all the things you know about what the Spirit of God does, just think about the things he does even before you come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. The Holy Spirit regenerates you. That is, he imparts spiritual life to you so that you can even respond to the gospel message. 
If it were not for the role of the Holy Spirit, when you heard the gospel, you would have just shoved it aside and not paid any attention to it. It's the Spirit of God that enables you to embrace the gospel. Then it's the Holy Spirit of God that baptizes you. He places you into the body of Christ. You become a part of God's family because of the action of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. The Holy Spirit of God also indwells you. He actually takes up residence inside of you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit seals us. He makes sure that no one can take us out of God's hand. That's the seal of the Holy Spirit of God. And all the way through your life as a Christian, the Spirit of God does things for you that you probably don't even recognize. He prays for you, the book of Romans chapter 8 tells us. He convicts us of sin, First John chapter 3. He bears witness to our spirit that we belong to God. That's another passage from Romans chapter 8. Then he teaches us, he guides us, he sanctifies us, he fills us. He gives gifts to us so that we can be of help to one another. All those are things the Spirit of God does on a daily basis for you and me, and we probably don't even recognize that he's doing those things. All of those are things he does for those who have come to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. What Jesus has to address in John 16, though, is not what the Holy Spirit of God does for you. It's what the Holy Spirit of God does for the world. What does the Spirit of God do for those who have not trusted Christ as Savior? What is the Spirit of God doing in the world today among your friends and family who have never come to faith in the person of Jesus Christ? What is the role of the Holy Spirit in their lives? Now that is the essence of John chapter 16. Now, I said a minute ago that there are three things the Spirit of God does for people in the world who have never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. I want to direct you right to the Word because it doesn't matter what I believe. It does matter what Jesus says. And here in John chapter 16, most of the words of John 16 are the words of Jesus. How do I know that? They're in red in my Bible. That's how I know that. Oh, there are other reasons, too, of course, but they happen to be in red in my Bible. Let me start at verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. When he says the world, he's talking about people who don't know the Savior. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, Jesus has just made this wonderful promise. I'm going to go, but the Spirit is going to come. And when the Spirit is going to come, when He comes, He will do three things in the world. He will convict the world, first of all, of sin. Now, let's spend a few minutes talking about that. The Holy Spirit of God convicts unbelievers, convicts people in the world of sin. What does that mean, and how does He do it? Well, it simply means that through the ministry of the preaching of the gospel, Every time I open the Word and you hear it on radio or television or someplace else, every time you live a life that pleases the Lord God, you live a life that is exemplary of what a Christian is, every time that happens, every time godly lives of believers are implanted in the lives of unbelievers, the Spirit of God uses the preaching of the Word, uses your godly living as kind of a spur to convict the world of its sin. This is a world that hates Christ. And it hates you because it hates Christ. So what Jesus has already said is, look, you have to recognize that if you're living the way the Spirit of God wants you to live so that he can convict the world of sin, you will be a spur in the side of the world. You're not going to get along with the world and embrace them. You'll show them where their sin is in their lives. That'll be the Spirit of God using your life to convict the world of its sin. Now, don't be misled here, though. Conviction and conversion are not the same thing. Just because the Spirit of God uses your life to convict the world, convict your brother-in-law, convict your neighbor, convict your friends of sin, doesn't necessarily mean that person will come to know the Lord as Savior. But it's the work of the Spirit of God through your life that brings about the opportunity for them to see the difference between you and them. And if there is no difference... Well, that's something we'll talk about later on in this week. What happens when we don't actually live a life 
that enables the Spirit of God to work through us. So the first thing he does is this. The Spirit of God convicts the world of sin. The second thing he does, verse 10, is the Spirit of God convicts the world of righteousness. Now, I know that sounds strange. Why would the Spirit of God convict the world of righteousness? Shouldn't he convict the world of unrighteousness? I mean, you would think that's what it would say. But it doesn't say that. I think this has to be explained right in the context of what he is saying here. Jesus said, because I go to my Father, you will see me no more. And as a result of seeing me no more, the world needs to know what happened to me. Now think about this. The Jewish religious leaders in Jesus' day, they are very, very much convinced that Jesus is a sinner. They are very much convinced that he is perverting their religion. He is a Jew who is not living, they think, the way Jews ought to live. So John chapter 19, verse 7 says, The Jews answered him, that's Pilate, when he said that he found no fault in Jesus. The Jews answered him and said, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, Jesus never made himself the Son of God. He always was the Son of God. But their view is he's doing something you cannot do and be innocent according to our law. In fact, in John chapter 9, remember the story of Jesus when he met the man who was born blind and he made the salve out of the dirt in the ground and he put it on his eyes and the man went away and he came back seeing. After that, when the Jewish religious leaders got a hold of this man, they said this to the man. They said, Give glory to God. We know this man, talking about Jesus, we know this man is a sinner. Now, they don't know Jesus is a sinner, but they've assumed that because of his message, he must be unrighteous. So when the Spirit of God convicts the world of unrighteousness, the world is treating Jesus as an evildoer. The world is treating Jesus as just another religious leader who's got his own set of followers and he's no better than anyone else and he's just one way to God. That's the way the world treats Jesus. And what the Spirit of God is going to do, it is going to convict the world of the fact that the world lives in unrighteousness. And it's not the righteousness of the world that the Spirit of God convicts them of. It's their lack of righteousness. It's that they crucified the Lord of glory. So throughout the course of your life, when you're living a life that pleases the Lord, when you're witnessing for your faith, when you're living a way that will draw people to the Savior, when that's true, it will show the world how unrighteous it was to kill the only Savior you and I would ever have. So the Spirit of God does two things. First of all, He convicts the world of sin. Secondly, He convicts the world of righteousness, literally the lack of righteousness. And here's the third thing He does, verse 11. He convicts the world of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, quite frankly, I think this is the most interesting of the three things the Spirit of God is going to do. The death of Jesus Christ paid for your sin. He was the sinless, spotless, sacrificial Lamb of God. He took away the guilt for your sin. But what about those who don't receive Christ? What's going to happen to them? Well, we know that the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus was a condemnation to Satan. The last thing Satan wanted was Jesus to go to that cross. And behind that, the last thing he wanted was him to rise from the dead. Jesus did both of those things. So Satan is not a happy camper at this point. In fact, if you remember back in chapter 12 at verse 31, it says this, Now the ruler of the world will be cast out. Everything Jesus did brought condemnation to Satan made Satan look bad. Now, here's the thing you want to remember. Satan is still alive and well today. He's roaming about as a roaring lion, seeking people that he can deceive, and that would be people like you and me. But Satan is a toothless enemy. Satan knows he's been defeated. It's kind of like a convicted criminal on death row awaiting the final punishment. He knows he's convicted. He knows he's not leaving. But he still tries to do his very best to convince people that he's the good guy. Satan is doing that in our lives now. Now, don't miss this. Everyone who clings to Satan and to the lies of Satan receives the same fate that Satan receives. Hell was not created for people. But people end up in hell because they side with Satan. Satan. 
And so the Spirit of God is going to convict the world of the judgment of Satan. And in the process, the judgment of people who side with Satan comes at the same time. That's a really serious thing. Those are the three things Jesus tells us in John chapter 16 that the Spirit of God will do after Jesus has left. There is, however, one last thing in John 16 we need to see today, and I don't want you to miss this. I'm going to come back in just a second, and I want to wrap up our study today with what I think is a very, very important conclusion to what Jesus has to say about the role of Satan and the Spirit of God in our lives today. This is Back to the Bible with Woodrow Kroll. If you missed any of today's teaching, you can hear it online at backtothebible.org. Before we finish today, I want to draw your attention to verse 12 of John chapter 16. Listen as I read. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. This is what I don't want you to miss. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Now, what's the import of this closing section of John chapter 16? Jesus was equal to God the Father. And yet he set aside his authority as an equal to God the Father to come to this earth, submit his will to the will of the Father to accomplish your redemption. So in the garden... When Jesus was wrestling with his future, he said, not my will, but yours be done. Again and again and again, Jesus said, I don't speak what I have to say. I speak what the Father gives me to say. Does that mean Jesus had nothing to say? Of course not. He had equal to say that the Father did. But he understood that to accomplish your redemption, he had to set aside not only all the trappings of glory, He had to set aside the exercise of his own personal will and glorify the Father. Did he deserve the glory the Father got? Yes, he did. But he wasn't worried about that. Now, he says, when the Spirit of God comes, the Spirit of God will do the same thing to me that I have done to the Father. He will submit His will to my will, and I will submit my will to the will of the Father. Here are three equal persons who understand very, very clearly what it's like to get along with three equal persons. Now, that's why they're such a wonderful example for you and me today. The Spirit of God is every bit the equal as the Son of God, and every bit the equal of the Father, God the Father. But all of them, God the Son and God the Spirit, submit their will to God the Father in this case, submit their authority to God the Father, and submit their glory to God the Father. So if you want to practice Christianity the way the Bible defines Christianity to practice, you only worship the Spirit so you can worship the Son. And you only worship the Son so you can worship the Father, because that's what they did. Any exercise of the role of the Lord Jesus or the role of the Holy Spirit that does not ultimately shine glory on the Father gives exercise to your worship of the Spirit and of the Son that they never intended to have and did not want themselves. So why is that important for you and me today? It's important to remember that the Spirit of God is working today just like Jesus Christ worked when he was on this earth. And all this is a part of the total plan of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Long before there was even time, and they're working their plan to perfection today. You want to be a part of that plan, get in the stream of what the Spirit of God is doing in glorifying Christ. And get in the stream of what the Son is doing in glorifying the Father. When you do that, you do today exactly what the Spirit of God and the Son of God were designed to do for God the Father too. 
Well, Dr. Kroll, we've talked off and on through the program today about the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go back to that for the close. Once we feel that convicting power of the Holy Spirit, what do we do then and what are the next steps? I think the first thing we have to do, Tam, is get a grip on this. Sometimes it's hard for us to admit what the Spirit of God is convicting us of. We say, oh, that's not so bad, or, you know, show me where that is in the show me where that is in the Bible. You're talking to the author of the Bible when you say that, you know. Show me, Spirit, where I have been wrong. We have to get a grip on who it is who's convicting us first. Then, secondly, I think we have to admit that he's right. That what we are doing is not pleasing to the Father. It, in fact, is sin. And the Bible has a way to deal with sin. First, great, great verse. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we kind of get a grip on how serious this is. We admit it. We confess it. He forgives us of it. And then we forsake it. Okay, there are other roles of the Holy Spirit. So once we do that... Is that where the comforting role of the Holy Spirit comes in? That's true. The Spirit of God is not designed just to make your life miserable because you sin. The Spirit of God is designed in His role to take away that sin and take away the punishment of that sin and the guilt of that sin even now so that you can be comforted by the Spirit of God. Tomorrow in our study, we're going to continue here in John 16 and we're going to look specifically at what the Spirit of God does to bring comfort to your life, how the Spirit of God can change sorrow into joy. Now, my guess is there isn't a single one of us that wouldn't like the sorrow of our life changed into joy. What is the role of the Spirit of God in doing that? That's what we'll focus on tomorrow. Well, thanks for being a part of our study group today. Thanks for your questions and for your participation. Thank you at home as well for being a part of our study group. It's always a joy to have you as a part of our listening family. God bless you. I'm Woodrow Kroll. My prayer is the same every day for you at this time, that you would have a good and godly day. For of what lasting value is a good day, if it's not also a godly day.